Hey Shrub Crafters, I have a book today that I want to talk about. The Book of Camping and Woodcraft from Capart. Now this is uh, uh, Horace Capart was uh, about 40 years after Nesmuk or uh, George Sears. And with all the modern shrub crafting books out there, or I'm sorry, bush crafting books out there, um, Cody Lundeen, Dave Canterbury, um, uh, Alone in the Wild there, uh, what's his name? Um, Les Stroud. There's a lot of books out there on camping. There's a lot of books out on woodcraft. There's a lot of camping books uh, for shrubcraft, bushcraft. Um, Horace Kephart, though, was a book that uh, I had not picked up, meant to for years, and just never got around to it. And I have to say, I should have started with this book. Um, being an Eagle Scout, my parents uh, definitely made it worthwhile getting into the camping, uh, learning everything as a kid. But once I had an opportunity to start learning myself, this is a book that I wish somebody had said, buy first. Uh, if there's one book that I can recommend if you are getting into bushcrafting or shrubcrafting, that is going to be Horace Kephart's. Uh, I'll talk about uh, George Sears Nesmuk's book uh, a little bit later. This one, though, comes in two editions. This is the uh, two-volume-in-one. Two this is the Camping and Woodcraft, which is a handbook for vacation campers and for travelers in the wilderness. Um, and it is a, facili uh, a facsimile edition with an introduction by Jim Casada. Um, Text-wise, I mean, here's my hand size of the book. It is split up into two different books, uh, which has everything you need to know about outdoors. Uh, it, it's an authority on book. It's easy to read. These are scanned pages and put down into this two volume set. Awesome, awesome book. I'm going to show you this one, which is the uh, field size 1910 heritage edition which is off of his original, I believe, 1906, um, and it has pictures. So if anybody who knows me, uh, pictures make everything awesome. Yeah, so copyright was 1905, uh, and it's 1906, 1908. This is a 1910 edition, and I'm just going to go through chapter. Uh, there's an introduction, and then it starts with Camping and Woodcraft. Chapter 1 talks about outfitting. Now, he generally lays this book out that you are a city person uh, trying to outfit yourself. Now, in 1910, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have dicks, uh, they didn't have sports authorities, they didn't have your local uh, store. So you had an outfitter, somebody who was in an area that was a uh, high adventure uh, location, traveling, you could hire out most of the stuff that you need. They also had a lot more vacation time, apparently, because he talks about going away for a month at a time, uh, or for the whole summer, and uh, what you need to bring. Outfitting yourself, the chapter just goes on everything from why you would use a blanket, a 100% wool blanket, using a browse bed, um, what to pack, what to bring. He has uh, a checklist uh, in a later chapter that goes along with it. But then he goes right into clothing. One of the things that we have is the luxury of lightweight, breathable clothing. Back then, he talks about um, having a suit and having a suit that you can wear in the woods. He talks about uh, what type of protection, um, underwear, uh, let's see here, underwear, trousers, what to use, leggings, why you would use them, what type of shoes, how to waterproof leather, something to make your own waterproof. You can find it up on the internet, but he actually talks about it. He talks about use of moccasins, why they're so good in the woods, why you can be quiet with them, how to uh, dry them out. He talks about packs and shanks, um, waterproofing clothing, uh, wading boots, hats, what works, what doesn't. Uh, head nets, gloves, belts, everything you need to know in there. And, and surprisingly, I kind of assumed that back in 1910, our technology nowadays, we've learned more. Most of what they still talk about with your Under Armour's breathability and all that, he talks about in 1910. Uh, so one thing that I learned out of this book throughout the whole thing is the wealth of knowledge that was available. A lot of it that he talks about is current up and coming. But some of this information today is still being portrayed as current up and coming. He then goes into personal kits, your prime necessity, cots, 
uh, browse beds, mattresses, how to make one, what to bring. Uh, he talks about bringing a, a set of sheets from home. Uh, sleeping bags, the pros and cons. Obviously, we live in a, a, a world where sleeping bags are lightweight, breathable, can dry quickly. Uh, but he talks about all the things that you should know as a person going into the shrub, what you need to know. It's so pertinent to today, and it was the same for him back then. He does a lot on shelter cloth, individual cook kits, uh, his opinion of a sheath knife, <clears throat> and... Uh, if you've ever done any research of Nesmuk and Horace Kephart, the Kephart knife is one of those mysteries that uh, bear trying to get to the root of. There's a lot of, uh, uh, and that's going to be a whole other video, but I'm, not, I'm just going to kind of touch on it. Uh, in here, he talks about a specific knife that an old backcountry person made for him. He's very well known for having a, a, a blacksmith make him a knife, which was later sold as his knife. Uh, but then he references a different knife that somebody in the backwoods made. So there's a lot of conjecture that it's the one and the same knife that these uh, Pennsylvania guys made for him versus did somebody actually make him a knife. There's some drawings and other things that are out there. Uh, the interpretation is right here in the book. Uh, and there's websites devoted to the Kephart design as well as tons of manufacturers making their version. It talks about the use of a three-blade jackknife and a hatchet and why he, those are the ultimate tools. Uh, bringing a whetstone makes uh, one little tidbit that I think is really cool. Uh, obviously, we can buy whetstone now that fits in little pieces. Uh, but he says get some emery cloth and glue it to a, uh, take a, uh, a cigar box about two by six inches and glue to each side a strip of emery cloth, a coarse one on one and fine on the other, and you can pack it. Great little idea. Take an emery cloth. I've always used sandpaper. You could do the same thing. But here he is in 1910 doing the same thing. Uh, emergency kits, compass, having a timepiece, matchbox, matches, uh, maps, stationery, medicines. Uh, he actually has probably one of the greatest prepper lists for the zombie apocalypse for the shrub crafting kit that I think anybody should have. He talks about potassium permanganate, uh, cocaine and morphine tablets, and how we can just go to our grocery store and pick them up from our uh, pharmacist. But he has... That aside, he actually has a lot of uh, lists in here that really make you self-sufficient. Uh, he talk, gives you recipes on make your own fly dope to keep flies away. Uh, the use of acids uh, in your water, um, clothes in a bag, a toilet bag, a repair kit, uh, you know, having rifle rods, cleaning kits, goggles, uh, a pouch canteen, pocket rifle. All of the information here is so pertinent. It just I flew through this reading uh, thinking it would be a little more tedious. It's not. Uh, he has a chapter four. It's all about tents. Um, if you're interested in teepees, canvas tents, tarps, uh, excellent, uh, excellent experience and knowledge on here because that was the current thing of the day. And I found it fascinating. This was a, kind of the, the tedious chapter, though. Uh, utensils and food. How to do well? Fire irons, ovens, fry pans, coffee pots, a kit for four. It also talks about a kit for two. How to make a tin grub box or bringing one. Cheesecloth, substantial foods that you should have. What you can survive on. Um, he talks about pemmican, uh, making your own uh, food to bring through uh, on your journey. Uh, about variety, standard rations. He references the military manuals of the turn of the 1900s. Uh, cold weather food, tobacco, packing meat, preserving butter. Uh, really fascinating because how do you preserve butter? Good fruit, uh, uh, what is this? A good fritcher, uh, frying fat, beverages, canned meats, soup stock, eggs, how to keep eggs, uh, milk, how to keep that in travel, and the creamed milks uh, now in powder form, which again was new for them. But uh, absolutely phenomenal information some of ways and he goes into the next chapter about how you can preserve meats and literally ship fish from one coast to another without them spoiling with just uh, proper packing things that i think are super pertinent if you are taking this into the realm of uh, survivability living off the grid if you have to or just knowing how to do it chapter six is the checklist for packing up now this is just like in cody lundy and dave's books gives you uh, everything that you need to know i'm not going to cover it because it's very exhaustive he gives you the weights of food and how much you should have and how much it might weigh. So one of the guys going on the early, early ultralight systems, 
He then talks about camp and what makes a good camp. He talks about uh, being a tenderfoot in the woods, um, how to set up camp, how to make it nice, um, you know, how to pitch your tent, what is a wall tent, setting it up, how to make a frame for a wall tent, teepees, field camps, fixed camps versus uh, a mobile camp, having a wood yard. He then talks about campfires and camp fuel goes in depth on woods that you can use that burn longer, some that burn hotter, some that are smoky, some that spit, uh, you know, with the, the water coming out of them. Softwood interiors, kindling, how to make it, process it, how to light a match in wet uh, weather or the wind, and making fire without matches. Um, that rep, that portion, rep, uh, he wants you to have a muzzle loader uh, or uh, some black powder, uh, if not using some smokeless powder, getting proper tinder, and how to build a proper fire, um, how to make a hunter's fire, talks a lot with the Indians and, and what they have uh, compared to how we uh, operate. Then he talks about marksmanship in the woods, and one of the big things in his chapter there is uh, how much you should have, being able to carry, his mentality was being able to put a gun on, some minimum stuff, and go out in the woods and, and not panic. And that is, uh, uh, this is kind of geared towards the 1900s, where you're now living in cities and you don't really have a place in the city uh immediately to shoot so you're shooting at ranges which a lot of us still do to this day and it's not being able to just go out and be like the country person who grew up in the country shooting you know going through the woods uh, i was fortunate enough to be doing that uh, however the, he's referencing if you live in the city what do you do and how to get better um, dressing and keeping game chapter 10 it's how to butcher packing deer on a saddle how to drag a deer um, talks about making an indian pack out of the skin making litters how to hang for butchering, how to butcher a deer, step by step. Uh, phenomenal information. I've done a lot of that. Uh, I do commercial trapping. I skin a lot. There's stuff in here that I was even learning. I'm like, hey, that's an awesome way to, to speed something up. Um, butchering on the ground versus hanging. Talks about elk and moose. Care of your carcass. How to keep it. How to guess, uh, guess them at weight. How to dress birds. Uh, cleaning fish. Bullheads and eels. Uh, how to keep fish, how to cure venison, dry fish, prepare for shipment. This is the thing that was fascinating, is that he says fish prepared in this way can go from Maine to New Orleans in August and will remain fresh and nice. And that is uh, using how to wrap them in muslin. Um, so excellent information, stuff I didn't know and I don't find on the internet in good detail. It's right here in this book all along. Chapter 11 was Camp Cookery. Uh, how to cook, what to do, using a fire, using a range, how to use coals. Uh, Dutch oven cooking, clay ovens, uh, how to make bread, um, dumplings, bacon in the Dutch oven. He gives you recipes for army bread, bannock, sourdough bread, self-rising bread, salt-rising bread, uh, bake rise bread in a pot. One of the things that I thought was excellent was he talks about um, plain cornbread, but how to make a reflector oven that he says your grandmother would have and he tells you how uh, he tells you how to use one so if you look up what a reflector oven is it's basically a flat piece of metal with some sides that reflect back out on the heat I am planning I have a bunch of uh, scrap aluminum that I've been saving out of uh, an old heater that died it's flat and it's perfect for it so I'm gonna make one and we're gonna take it up uh, to the property and see how it does but he gives recipes on how to make that type of food and uh, for the newbie who doesn't know how to do a lot of these things he gives you great recipes uh, and bacon and salt pork is one of his best things in here so nothing's changed how to broil how to cook how to fillet um, how to grill on rocks how to cook with uh, hot rocks how to choose a rock braising meat um, stewing uh, venison sausage he gives you recipes in here this is just um, phenomenal he talks about ground hogs muskrats um, you know, woodchucks, canned fish, dried meat, smoked herrings, broiled fish, um, how to eat fish, cook fish, uh, save fish, crawfish, uh, potatoes, boiled, baked beans. I mean, it's, it's all the camp food that we like. It's in here, and he has recipes with it. Talks about making desserts uh, and pies. Chapter 12, Pests of the Woods. Um, he talks about uh, mosquitoes. He talks about flies, preventatives, how to make a dope, fly dope to keep them off. Um, he gives you his recipes in here, and you can make them. Uh, Blood-sucking flies, blowflies, pests of the tropic. He goes through in so much detail how, how to, uh, what what it is and how to deal with it that it's so applicable to today. I, I'm telling you, this book, you've got to get it. On eBay, I think they're like 10 12 bucks free shipping. Um, Northern Chiggers, Tropical Chigos, 
Um, talks about ticks, punkies, insects in camp. He talks about using fungus to make a uh, smudge that you can keep with you that keeps them away and how to find those mushrooms slash fungi to be able to do that. He talks about scorpions, tarantulas, centipedes. Um, there's another chapter subsequently on first aid. talks about snake. I learned more about snake bites in his book than I have in between scouting and internet researching. Um, and when I say that, it's not, I mean, I, I heard everything. He sums it up very well and uh, keeps it simple. So that the extra information that's pages and pages online, he keeps simple. He talks about keeping a course in chapter 13 in the woods. He talks about uh, care of your feet, overstraining yourself, thirst, rough travel. Uh, use of divides. Gives a great map on how to travel from one direction to another without getting lost. Goes through a whole section of uh, navigation, waterways, and then he does blazing. Putting a blaze on a tree to blaze a trail, if you've ever heard that term, was actually marking trees. Um, but he goes into how survey markers and lines were drawn out by the early surveyors, and it makes a lot more sense to me. Having a natural sense of direction is really just paying attention to the details, and he reiterates that, and it makes you realize that it, when you're in the sameness of a forest that looks all the same, paying attention to details is what makes one person feel more comfortable in the woods. Uh, how to average celestial guides in the pole stars. He talks about um, you know how, how to do basic navigation. There's a whole chapter, blazes, survey lines, and natural sign of direction. This one is how it all lays out town grids, how they're broken up. And living in modern times, you can look at this and go, wow, okay, I understand that. Now I know where I'm at, and you get a general direction. And the rules are the same because they were laid out by the early found, uh, founding uh, surveyors of the country. Corner marks how to find them and how they're divided. He talks about uh, using growth rings um, of a tree. So if you happen to cut down a tree, growth rings grow uh, further on one side and closer together on the other, which do indicate a natural tendency uh, towards north. I believe it was north. I, I may be getting wrong on that. But there's a natural tendency, and uh, he actually gives you the numbers. <clears throat> we see it was in New York State. Forest Commission, they did 700 trees in the Adirondacks, noting that in each case, the compass point toward which the longest radius of the woods, so again, which side was the longest, and uh, it pointed, and the result was out of the 700 trees, 471 pointed north, 81 to the nor uh, northeast, 106 to the east, and then there was one to south, none to southeast, 27 to the west, none, or six to southwest, and eight to northwest, so 94% face north and east of a growth ring on that longest plane. So you can navigate by that. He talks about navigating with moss on the north side of the tree. Now, in my own shrub forest, moss grows around all sides of the tree. I do find, however, you find a, a denser growth, growth and a newer growth on the north side of the tree. Now, I know which way north is, but I have seen that. So does it apply? Well, people say it does. Uh, getting lost, and this is not a chapter on... Uh, uh, like the let's go get lost in the woods. It's okay. What do you do if you get lost? So he actually addresses psychology of man, how to survive. Talks about uh, his one of his big times when he got lost and panic started to set in. He talks about risk in the woods, um, about sitting down, stop, think, breathe, act. Uh, same as you would do in diving. Anytime you're lost, just stop. Think about what you're doing. Breathe. Relax. He gives you some pointers on there and, and how to think. How people get lost, what to do, how to get out, um, what you know, and again goes with our bug out, shrub out bags, having one for the day. Uh, chapter uh, 16 is emergency foods living off the country. So he talks about having a fishing pole. Uh, again, heavy reliance on if you have a pack mule, uh, if you have a gun, you have ammo. Not everybody goes out with that stuff. I do. Doesn't mean I want to get something. So having traps, knowing how to do traps. Uh, he doesn't really talk about primitive traps at all. That's where Cody Lundin, Dave Canterbury, and some of the other books, uh, Les Stroud, are much better. The, uh, um, he talks about parched Indian meal, how to make it. Uh, Rockahominy, it, he gives the, uh, the original ways to do it and how you can take this little bit of protein and you take a couple mouthfuls and you can go all day on it because just the way, uh, the concentration of, uh, of the food. Uh, how to do jerked venison how to make pemmican, concentrated meats, 
meat straights. Again, a lot of this is uh, uh, small deer, what uh, a lot of people call small deer squirrels. Um, talks about uh, dog horse flesh not being so good. And he's talking a lot of times because in 1900, he's referencing Lewis and Clark. He's referencing the uh, Daniel Boones, uh, Jedediah Smiths, and so on, uh, and how they survived in the wild. Uh, boiling water without a kettle, using skins and rocks. Uh, chapter 17, Edible Plants of the Wilderness. He goes through, in probably one of the most detailed things, um, herbs, and this is all edible plants. When they come out, how to find them, what they, uh, he doesn't give a great description of what they are, so having an herb book, but his uses on what's poisonous, what's not, how to take it, and if it is poisonous and it needs to be processed, he tells you how to do all that. So excellent information. Again, learned more in that chapter than I did because there's edible books. It tells you what it is, what you can eat, how to do this, this. His actually tells you how to break them down and what the uh, Native Americans and our ancestors were doing. Um, then he goes into chapter 18, which is axemanship, qualities of wood and bark, how to cut a tree with an axe. There are no chainsaws in 1910. So how to cut them with an axe, and then he gives these great little diagrams on how a tree is divided to get boards, knowing how to split and cut. And he goes through that and talks about axe experts, how to log up, how to split timber, how to fell trees, and then he goes through and lists very hardwoods, hardwoods, softwoods, medium hardwoods, and he tells you what whether to use them green uh, or to use them dried. It's just so much information in this book for the cheap price that it is. I'm almost thinking of getting a couple of copies and putting them in bags because if you get lost with one book in the woods, it's this one. It applies so well and so universally written to give you just a sense of this is the stuff that you need to do because this is the old world style of going out in the woods. Um, how to quick season uh, wood, how to bend wood, uh, how to get bark off of a tree, how to make bark bags, packs, how to make rope twine, root and vine cordage, fitting axe helves. Uh, he talks about how to burn out an axe handle when you're rehanging an axe. Um, that was one of my things I've heard a lot of, but nobody ever has ever explained it well. To burn out an axe handle, he says, you take your blade and bury it in the dirt, put your handle with it cut off, in and have build the fire over it, but covering the steel so that the steel stays cold. I always wonder, okay, how do you do that? And as long as you can maintain that fire, uh, easy to do. And very, very nice. Talks about how to make a uh, stump into a vice. Ingenious. Cabins, how to make mortar. Uh, charcoal, how to make a charcoal pit inside the grounds, digging four or six feet down, I think, five, yeah, five feet square by three feet deep. You build a fire and just keep piling, piling, piling on how to make your own charcoal. I, I got to make a charcoal pit because I don't want to go pay $10 a bag. But uh, he talks about lime and how to make it and, and, and just so much information. Uh, trophies, buckskin, and rawhide, chapter 19. Uh, skinning the head gives you diagrams how to skin if you're going to save it. Uh, talks about how to make buckskin, which is not a tanned skin in, in true essence. Modern day buckskin uh, really is a tanned uh, skin. We talks about the real use of a buckskin and how they, uh, how you make it, soak it, get it so that it is soft and pliable. It's not quite as soft and supple uh, as they would leave you to believe as today's buckskin. But how to do an Indian tan um, tells you how to make a flat iron scraper. Nobody that I know of sells a flat iron scraper other than handicraft guys. So you can like, uh, and, and I'll touch on that right now. Flat iron scraper. You want to make one, and I'll show you one uh, down the road. Go get yourself an old hand plane, uh, preferably a jack plane. Find one at the yard sale that's rusted. You can get the blade right out of it for probably 50 cents, a couple of bucks at most. Take the blade of a flat iron, cut it in half, sharp, keep that sharp edge, round it out, and you can attach it to a stick. If you watch Mountain Men, you'll see that guy Tom Orr. Um, he uses a, a style like this. Otherwise, go to the big box store, Home Depot, Lowe's. They sell replacement Chinese-made steels for jack planes for a couple of bucks. You can do the same thing if you don't want to go find one at a yard sale. Uh, the steel back then uh, that they were using back in the jack planes, though, is phenomenal. So it would be a cool way to do it. 
uh, how to smoke a skin for waterproofing, how to make rawhide, uh, uh, par flesh, par uh was a French adaptation of an Indian word, which was the uh, uh, used for uh, uh, hide buckets and so on. Wang leather, talking about squirrel skins uh, for shoestrings, woodchuck skins. Never tried to skin a woodchuck because um, everyone I get is in a commercial trap that I'm doing for somebody, and every one of them, unfortunately, has been dead for at least 24 hours. And most of the time, the problem is in the summertime, so the meat and the skin are no good by the time I get to them within my 24-hour limit. Um, but he's talking about using them, and they make a great skin for that. Uh, a riata, cat gut, uh, membranes, uh, parchment, out of, uh, how to make parchment, waterproof it, how to make translucent parchment using uh, the white of eggs. Uh, and then chapter 20 is tanning pelts, other animal products. And he talks about full-on tanning using alum. A lot of people will say battery acid is one of the keys if you want to tan your own hides. Uh, people nowadays, there's a safe alternative to battery acid. Battery acid is relatively safe as long as you take the right precautions. Uh, how to do robes Indian tans. Now they're not as soft and supple again. Indian tanning is a, a much harder uh, tan. You gotta do a lot of breaking of the skin. Uh, tanning of a snake skin, how to make glue, working with horn, how to make a drinking horn, how to make a hunting horn, powder keg. He also talks about how to make a horn cup. How cool is that, a horn cup out of one horn and how to soften it up, steam it with, or water steam it and, uh, and bend it into a drinking vessel. Uh, getting bear's oil, rattlesnake oil, how to make a slush lamp, candles, uh, soap making, lye running, all stuff that our grandparents or great-grandparents knew how to make, and it's in this book. Uh, chapter 21, Accidents and How to Treat Them. This is a medical, uh, uh, in essence, this is like an early medical thing. Uh, he talks about how to try to find, uh, if you have a cut in an artery, how to uh, try to find it, reattach it, how to uh, apply a tourniquet. Uh, not everybody knows that you need to apply a tourniquet. Once you apply, you turn it on and leave. You can always put something underneath the tourniquet, like a little pebble or something, to keep direct pressure open and close it slowly so that you can allow the limb to stay alive. He talks about that. Uh, he talks about how to clean wounds, how to use natural cleanings, as well as field kit cleaning, which he encourages. Uh, closing wounds, dressing wounds, uh, burns, a poultice, how to make a poultice and what it is. Uh, salves, sprains, how to make a tincture, tease, broken bones, fainting. He talks about shock. Uh, concussions, stunning, sunstroke, excess fatigue, famish, thirst, freezing, poisonous plants, insects, bite of a rabid animal. We got modern medicine. They didn't have my. They don't have. Uh, at this point, they don't have Louis Pasteur's cure for rabies. So a rabid animal. Um, drink enough whiskey to counteract shock. Apply a tourniquet, and uh, then cut out the whole wound with a knife, and then cauterize it to the bottom with a hot iron. The logic being you're getting the bacteria out of there. Uh, he talks about snake bite and um, really talks uh, in depth about venomous snakes, uh, copperheads, he talks about cotton mouths, their habitat, where they're at, rattlesnakes. Um, doesn't talk about antivenom because antivenom is not really existent yet. Herbal remedies, uh, plants, flowers, things that you can do uh, to make yourself better. If you don't have a drugstore, and if you don't have it with you, this has got some great information. Uh, how to use a hypodermic syringe, and he talks about, uh, again, you gotta remember the old syringes had that insert needle, and they went through, you pull that out, and then you can actually pierce the skin, so he talks about using it. But picking up some disposable hypodermics and getting some of the stuff that he tells you you should have actually makes sense, and the stuff that he talks about in here, uh, you can still get um, and dissolving some product so that you can wash wounds, clean wounds, keep yourself safe. Obviously, we have much better uh, pharmacies available with creams, ointments, and tinctures, uh, but he does talk about some things that uh, uh, make a huge difference. Uh, drowning, though, you're not gonna learn anything about the drowning because uh, they want you to like move arms and things. Uh, chest compressions and CPR did not exist uh, like they do here. So uh, you, that you can skip, and that's it in this book start to finish those are the chapters those are the topics buy it if you're serious about shrub crafting bush crafting it's a phenomenal read it's well written uh some of it's a little tedious but uh you'll learn something i know i did so in the meantime stay safe shrub on